This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. This is Felina, and today I have on the show with me Diomidis Spinellis. He is a professor of software engineering and the head of the Department of Management, Science and Technology at the Athens University of Economics and Business. Until December, he served as the editor-in-chief of the IEEE Software Magazine. Diomidis is also the author of the 2016 book, Effective Debugging, and that's what we will talk about on this show today. Diomidis, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure to be on the show. So the first question is debugging. What exactly is debugging? I feel this term is a little bit overloaded. Sometimes people mean by debugging using a debugger, but sometimes people also just mean finding or fixing a mistake. What is debugging to you? Exactly. It is overloaded, but I think concentrating on the debugger is a mistake. And debugger is just a tool that's used in some specific purposes. It's not something that's the most useful tool for debugging. So I would say that debugging is a way to quickly identify and fix a fault. You can use many different approaches for that. One of them is the debugger. So something like putting print F statements everywhere, you would say that is also debugging. It's definitely a debugging method. It's sometimes quite useful, and there are good arguments for putting printf statements. For example, printf statements in the code get maintained with the code, so they survive code changes and refactorings and so on. Whereas if you do something in the debugger, if you create a macro, that might not survive the code, or it might only stay within your system. Your fellow developers will not see it. Oh, this is actually a good point, that printf statements also serve as some sort of mild documentation giving hints to other developers that there some debugging has taken place in that part of the code. Of course, but for larger systems, you need to do it more systematically. For example, using a logging framework. Think of Banyan, for example, for uh, Java, where you have specific ways to enable, disable statements and specify the level of uh, verbosity in the logging. Yeah, so that's like print F on steroids. You print everywhere. The framework takes care of some more efficient ways of handling things. So in your book, you talk about different strategies for debugging, and and we're already talking about different strategies at this point. And you categorize these debugging approaches in different groups. You say there are strategies and methods and tools and techniques. Can you give the listeners an overview of these different categories of debugging approaches? Sure. Sure. When we talk about strategies, these are things that you can employ independently of the problem. For example, one of my favorite strategies is to look for on the web for insights regarding the problem. So you, if you see an error message, you might put it in double quotes and search for that uh, m- message, and you might encounter an answer that says exactly why this has happened and how to fix it. There's nothing bad about it, it looking at the uh, how others have fixed a problem. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Or for example, one other thing I find useful is if I have a system that used to work and doesn't work anymore to see how these two things differ. This can apply to any type of problem or system. And this is why I call them high-level strategies. You then talked about uh, methods. So these are specific for, these are targeted to specific problems. One thing I think is very important is to make it to have to enable the efficient reproduction of the problem. If it takes you 10 minutes to reproduce a problem, then it's very difficult to fix it. You can try things and then have to, if you have cycles of 10 minutes, you proceed very slowly. So if you invest a bit of time in order to minimize, for example, the input set or what types of actions you need to perform in the program or automate them in order to quickly reproduce it, that's a very good method in order to become more efficient in uh, debugging. Another practice I think is important is once you have fixed uh, an error in your program to search for similar errors somewhere else and fix them as well. And then you also talked about tools. Then, of course, the debugger is one commonly used tool, but there are others that are less appreciated. Uh, The revision control system is one of them. So you may be using Git, for example, and I can talk more about that later. Or also monitoring tools that allow you to see how a specific program or process is operating. And 
correct in understanding that these strategies and methods are quite generic for all sorts of programming languages and systems, but that once we get to tools and techniques, they are a little bit more specific to programming languages. Is that correct? Or are there also tools and techniques that work for any programming language and any system? You are correct. As we move from strategies to methods to specific tools and techniques, we're becoming more concrete and more specific to given problems. One strategy might even be to sleep overnight for, you know, for to solve a problem. You work on it and then you say, I give up. You sleep overnight and may, often I found that the next morning you have a solution in your head or if not a solution, a different debugging approach. So that's a strategy. It's not a specific method or tool. Yeah, that might even be a good strategy for non-computer science related problems, just going to sleep and try it again the next day. Can you also give an example of some tools and techniques that are very specific to one programming language and wouldn't really work for another programming language? Yes, for example, there is a specific L-Trace is a tool that allows you to monitor calls to the C libraries. This is mostly useful when you're debugging C and C++ programs and it wouldn't be very useful for other languages. You will see very low level details in other languages. Or you might want to monitor packets flowing over the network. This again is useful for networking applications or for microservices and not for applications that are monolithic. And we're already talking about programming languages a little bit. And I want to look at education of programming languages because you mentioned these tools that are only useful in a certain setting for certain programming languages. And I I have this impression that if people switch teams, they go to another team or even to another company, they know they have to learn a new language. If they go to a company where they do Ruby development and, oh, I know I have to learn Ruby. But I think these Tools and techniques about debugging are somewhat overlooked as a new skill that people have to learn. So how do people learn about debugging? How do you pick this up? What are techniques for learning debugging? It's a very good question because it's not typically formally taught at the university. And I think you gain it through practice, through experience. The most important way in order to improve yourself, I think, is introspection. So every time you solve a problem, you find a fault, you fix it. Think what worked well, what didn't work well, what tools did you use, what tools would be useful in this case, and record them in your head or even a notebook so that you can apply them next time. Also look at colleagues. What are they using? What do they find useful? There are so many different approaches and tools that you need to always keep your eyes open and uh, think of how you can improve. That's one reason I have devoted my book to my mentors past and future. I think we can always constantly learn, become better at the debugging. I think it's very interesting that you mentioned that it's very much learning on the job. And I have this impression as well that that is the case. But I'm not sure if that's the most effective way for programming. We we have this concept, for example, called programming katas, where you have really tiny, small programming puzzles that you solve a bunch of times just so that you get the techniques of the programming language, let's say, in the fingers, wouldn't it be more effective also with debugging to test it, to practice on smaller examples rather than trying to solve a big problem and then also have some cognitive room in your brain left to think about, oh, what are the strategies that I applied? Have you tried any of these techniques to teach programming, or uh, sorry, to teach debugging in a smaller scope, either in companies or within a university maybe? I've tried some instances by giving examples of uh, such uh, methods or uh, tools. However, one problem is that in programming from small, even solving a small problem is uh, useful and you learn things. In debugging, typically a small a fault in a small piece of code is easy to find. The difficulty is if you have a system of millions of lines of code and there is one line there that's wrong, that's the most crucial difficulty and that's difficult to teach through small examples. That's why on-the-job training or through learning through experience is important in debugging. Yeah, that might be true that small examples are so trivial to find the bug that it doesn't really practice the skill well enough. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned already a little bit that universities typically don't teach debugging, but but shouldn't they, or shouldn't we, because the both of us are software engineering professors, shouldn't we teach debugging? Or do you say, no, this is a skill that doesn't really fit a programming education. This is purely something that industry should, should address. 
we definitely should be teaching debugging. I think we teach debugging by giving the students non-trivial exercises. Any program larger than a few lines will have bugs in it, and students or professionals in the, in the after they graduate will need to spend time in order to find those uh, problems, those errors, and fix them. So by that, you learn how to debug. More formally, I think that we should teach our students how to use a debugger, what other tools they can use, different approaches they can apply to problems. Yeah, I don't think when I was in university that they taught me how to learn a debugger. This is really a skill you just pick up in programming projects sort of by yourself, but that might not be the best the best strategy. So, so do you do this in classes? Do you teach classes where you show people how to use a debugger? We talk about the debugging tools and we have laboratory sessions where they use, for example, Eclipse and learn how to apply Eclipse in order to single step through a program or look at variables, uh, add breakpoints, and so on. These are the most important functions of a debugger. And I want to talk about assessment also a little bit, both in the context of a university course, but also in terms of recruitment. Because many companies, if they want to recruit programmers, they do whiteboard interviews where they test if people can program, at least in this setting. But I haven't heard of many companies that typically assess if people can use a debugger, if they can find bugs. Do you think this is a practice that is common and or should it be common? It should be it should be something that is assessed. I think it can be assessed through a discussion. So you can give a candidate a given problem and discuss how the candidate would approach that problem. An application is not responding or an application crashes. How would the candidate approach that problem? And through that discussion, you can quickly find out whether the candidate knows how to handle such problems or has experience with that or not. Oh, that's a good strategy. Just talk through a problem, not just have them debug specifically, but just talk about approaches. I, I like that as a strategy. I want to talk also a little bit about the workflow of debugging, because if people are debugging, they're often also involved in other activities like, like testing and refactoring. It's very rare that you just fix a, fix a bug and you're not looking at other parts of the code. So maybe can you describe what your ideal flow of a debugging process would be? Where do you start when you, when you know you're finished? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the first place to start would be to effect, efficiently reproduce the problem we talked about that earlier. Find the minimum working example that demonstrates the problem. And through that, you can find also the fault. Then you need to locate exactly where the fault is once you have isolated the failure. And there are various methods to do that. You can drill up or down. So start from the manifestation of the problem and try to find the line where it occurs or drill up so you have a specific line where you know that your program crashes through an ex exception or something uh, similar and uh, a wrong output and a wrong result. And you want to drill up to find out where why this problem has occurred. Both are valid strategies and there are different uh, times where each one is more useful than uh, the other. Once you have identified what was wrong in the problem, of course, you need to fix it. And then also comes some housekeeping. So that would involve, first of all, looking for other instances of the same problem and fixing those as well, ensuring that this doesn't happen in the future, perhaps through some refactoring or some additional documentation or the addition of some uh, assertions, and also communicating the problem to your group, your team. So you have an issue, you need to close it, uh, you may need, if it was a big problem, you may need to conduct a post-mortem and discuss it with your colleagues and so on. And is this process always the same? Do you have the same flow for all sorts of different types of bugs? Because I can imagine a security bug is really very different from a performance issue. Does this strategy always hold or are there different workflows for different types of issues? There are indeed different workflows. So you mentioned performance. This has a very different workflow. It has to do with measurement, understanding what the type of problem you are witnessing is. Is your system I.O. bound? Is it waiting a lot of time for packets to arrive from the network or from blocks to be read from the disk? Is it CPU bound? Is it tying your processor? And if that is the case, is the processor executing some code on your behalf or is it executing code within the operating system context? And then 
dr drilling down in order to find out hotspot areas, if it's CPU bound, specific functions, or even lines of code where the program is taking a lot of time. You would then use some strategy in order to improve the performance of your problem, for example, through a more efficient algorithm or by using a better data structure or even by, by removing many calls to the operating system. And then you would measure again in order to see whether you have fixed that performance problem or not. Okay. Fixing bugs is always risky, right? And there are many cases known, maybe you have a few examples where people try to fix one bug, but introduced another bug in another part of the system. How do you lower the risk of debugging and bug fixing? It is risky, but not as risky as say refactoring, where you start with a working system and you aim to give back a working system again. In debugging, you start with a system that has a fault in it, a system that has failed, and you need to fix that. So it's typically you will give a system that's a bit better than the system that you started with. How do you lower the risk? The answer is easy. You need to have a te to, you need to test the system. Ideally, you should have unit tests, integration tests, and so on that can assert that at the end of your session, your system is working as it was wor at, as it worked before. Here it's important before you start to fix the to fix the system to add an additional test that demonstrates the failure that you are trying to address, so that once you have fixed the fault, the system will pass that test as well. And also, as an additional bonus, if that fault is introduced in the future, the test will catch it. Yeah, so you're not just fixing the bug now, but you're also trying to make sure that the bug doesn't happen or similar bugs doesn't ha don't happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And that you know that you have actually fixed the bug. You can demonstrate it that the, facts, that the bug has been fixed. So I really enjoyed reading your book. It, the strategies are very, very useful. But I found here and there it, it goes a bit beyond debugging, maybe. For example, some of the, um, some of the strategies you mentioned are very much about code comprehension. For example, uh, item 47 says, write your code in a different programming language to gain a deeper understanding of what is happening. Or 66, rewrite your code at a higher level of abstraction. I would say those are almost strategies just for code comprehension, for understanding the code that would be useful also if I'm starting to work on a new code base, not even necessarily if there is a bug. So I guess my question is, is code comprehension a big part of debugging? And if so, how big? Mm -hmm. It depends on the problem. So some problems can be can be solved rather easily just by looking at a specific kind of at a specific line of your code. You see an Aldi reference and you understand that in the specific if statement you need to first check that the variable is not null before accessing a method through it. So that's easy. Probably you don't need to understand the whole code base. But there are other problems that are quite deep. You are manipulating a complex data structure and you need to obtain a specific result and the result is slightly wrong. You have a, a geom an application, a CAD application, and you have some lines that intersect when they should not intersect. How do you do deal with that? In that case, if you have a complex algorithm that you've developed yourself, it might be quite difficult to isolate the problem. Maybe the problem is not in a specific line, but in the way you manage the whole data structure or you have understood the problem. In this case, rephrasing the problem, rewriting it in a higher level language might get rid of many non-essential details and might help you get a clear picture of how to approach the problem and where the problem lies. So if you are at the same time trying to get correct the C pointers and to also understand a very complex algorithm that is uh, involves many routines, uh, you might be doomed. If you can express it easier using Python sets, for example, then you might understand the problem better and you either keep it in that higher level language or rewrite it again correctly in the lower level language that it was initially implemented in. Yeah, so you're saying that sometimes it is useful to rewrite the code in a different way, but not, not in all situations. Could you also give an example? In a minority, it's, it's useful in a minority of situations where we are dealing with very complex algorithms and you cannot fix them and understand them in the language they are written in. It's not a common approach, but sometimes it is useful.
Yeah, so you're saying it's the minority of cases. In most of the situations, this this would not be a viable strategy. Exactly. It's, it's mainly for hard algorithmic problems. Okay. And you also mention automation quite a bit in your book. One of your tips is even automate debugging tasks. Is debugging, is, is a big part of debugging automating the process? There is a large element in it, especially for non-trivial problems. So in some, in one instance, I had a problem where I needed to, the specific line was responding, a specific function was responding very slowly. But uh, the input that it was getting was quite complex. So the way I solved it was to write a small script that broke the input into parts and gave to the function each small part in series until I found a specific part of the input that was making the function respond very slowly. So automation can help you in a number of cases where you're dealing with complex inputs and uh, non-trivial processes. It allows you to drill down and find out what parts are responsible for a failure. And could you also give an example where automation would not really help? Are there specific types of problems where you say, well, maybe the automation would get in the way of understanding? It would be better to do it as manually as possible? Or is automation always good? Automation is good when you are dealing with complex input or complex tasks that are cumbersome to do manually. Uh, if the problem screams at you, if you have an exception in a specific line, often you don't need uh, automation. But if you have a 100 megabyte log file and you need to find out which line was responsible for the failure you are seeing, maybe automating the process of filtering that log file, uh, feeding your program with specific instances of lines that were uh, res associated with the problem can help you quickly arrive at the at the f source of the fault. So it's, it's a matter of scale as well. The larger your problem or the larger your code base, the more important automation gets. The code base and also the data you are handling. You, maybe you have a small code base, but huge amount of data which you need to process in some non-manual fashion automatically in order to arrive at the ones that are associated with the failure. We already talked a little bit about programming languages and different strategies, and I want to zoom into that a little bit more, because while reading your book, I thought, hmm, maybe it's the case that some strategies don't fit all programming paradigms. D do you agree with me? Are there some strategies that are a little bit more specific towards a certain programming paradigm? I can give an example. For example, your rule 33 is examine the va values of variables, if you work in a purely functional programming language, there are no vari variables, so there's nothing to inspect. So that rule doesn't really help. Do you agree with me that some of the par some programming paradigms fit really well with some strategies, but not with others? Yes, definitely. Some uh, approaches can work better with some languages than others. But again, this is not uh, doesn't mean that they cannot be used. You mentioned variables in functional languages. You often let a variable have a value, but only once in a functional language. So inspecting that may be helpful. Or other languages don't have good debuggers associated with them, or they are debuggers that are cumbersome to use. So it's easier to do to add logging or printf statements to them. So it always it, 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 what strategy is most effective really depends on the language and the tools that are associated with it. And, and how, how would you know this? How do you know what strategies fit what programming paradigm? Is this, again, just a matter of experience, or is there some sort of classification that people could read? It is experience because also things change. A new tool comes out that's very useful for a specific language. And it's uh, also a matter of uh, learning the best tools for, for a specific language. So looking around, Find and always trying to improve yourself. One important element is when you see yourself toiling needlessly to, in order to find a fault, to think, how could I do this better and invest in learning a new tool, in a new method, rather than trying the a process that's cumbersome again and again and again. If you don't improve yourself, then uh, you will never become an effective debugger. Yeah, so you also need metacognitive skills to, to think, hey, am I doing the right thing here? Is this a good strategy if I'm doing the same thing for three hours or if I'm de debugging the same type of problem every week, then maybe I need a better strategy. 
Exactly. So you might be using a strategy that allows you to find the source of the problem, but you also need always to think, how could I have done this better? Yeah, that's also general good advice in every situation. Look back and what, what was a good strategy here? What was helpful and where could I have been more effective? I also want to talk a little bit about newer programming paradigms because when I was in university, debugging was relatively easy because I ran a program on my machine and it was relatively small, so a debugger was very useful. But for example, now we have big web systems with a front end and a back end and maybe a model view controller system that I'm not directly executing all the code that I am working with. Does that affect how we do debugging? Do, do we as a field do debugging way differently on the web than on the back end? Or do you say, well, the, the big strategies are more or less the same? Doesn't really matter if, if it's a combination of different types of systems and languages. The big strategies always work, but when you want to use concrete methods and tools, then these things change. So for the systems that you described, you need to have a holistic view of the system to know all the parts of it and how they fit together, what is executed at the database level, what's executed on the client, what's executed on the server, how these fit together, what the API is, and how you can put monitoring, how you can have more, how we can monitor interactions between those elements. You already mentioned a holistic view of a whole system, which is, of course, a very, very great strategy. But what if your code depends heavily on libraries? Then it, it gets harder maybe to have a full view of what the system is doing because you haven't created all parts of the system and you might not have a deep understanding of what exactly you are depending on. What if you have to debug that type of code? What do you do with libraries? Yeah. One way is to monitor the interaction with the library to see if the, what you are sending to the library matches what it is expecting and what you are getting back matches what you are expecting to receive. And another thing that's often not done is to actually single step into the library. So having the source code of the library, which is often possible nowadays, either because the library is open source or because the vendors supply source code with the libraries. It, you didn't, this wasn't the case uh, often in the past. It allows you to go into the library and see what the library is doing. And by single stepping with a debugger through the library's code, you can often understand much better how the library is handling something. And you can either identify a misunderstanding from your part, how the library is operating, or actually see a bug within the library, which you can then sidestep or f ask the vendor to fix. And if we take such a system one step further, if we're, we're not talking about one big system with a few libraries, but we're talking about an architecture of microservices, does that impact debugging? How do you debug a system that has many separate components? It's definitely trickier. That's why there is a saying that if you cannot uh, handle something as a monolithic block, how can you expect it to work with it as a, and decompose it into microservices? Here, you definitely need the logging at uh, all levels and uh, by all microservices. You need better instrumentation in order to be able to re-enact a specific failure that you have seen from the form it was logged so that you can identify which microservice failed and why it uh, failed. Yeah, so the, the first choice is maybe how do we break up the system and then we try to debug the small parts and then debug the whole. Is that is that a good summary? You need to be able to understand how the whole is working through logging and then replay that logging in order to find out the specific fault. Yes. Try to identify the smallest part of your system exactly. where the error occurred and then debug it in the smallest scope possible. Exactly. In that sense, it might not be that different from a big system with a bunch of libraries because then also the same question is, where does the bug occur? Mm -hmm. DigitalOcean is the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications of any size, removing infrastructure friction and providing predictability so developers and their teams can deploy faster and focus on building software that customers love. DigitalOcean stands out from the crowd due to its simplicity, high performance, and no billing surprises. Join a community of over 3.5 million developers on DigitalOcean. Sign up with a free credit at do.co slash seradio. Do you think that as, as a field, if we take all software engineers or programmers together, are, are we getting better at this? 
debugging. What, what big advances have you seen in debugging in practice? We certainly have uh, more powerful tools nowadays. For example, now there are debuggers that allow you to step back in time. This is magical. It couldn't happen yeah. a decade ago. These tools work by recording every instruction that the processor takes in memory, the side effects of it, and allowing you to go back because you have plentiful memory and very powerful processors that allow you to do that. This is magic. I often find myself at a specific point realizing, ah, the fault was earlier. How can I now go back? With back-in-time debugging, you can actually do that and step through your code backward. So this is a big improvement. And we have other old tools that allow us to make our life easier. One other um, one of my another thing that I find extremely useful is data breakpoints. You can specify that you want your code to break when a specific value changes. This is a lot more difficult than code breakpoints because code breakpoints are simply implemented by adding uh, by putting a simple interrupt instruction at the point where you want the, your code to stop. Data breakpoints need the processor to monitor all data accesses to find out when a specific value changes. Modern processors have specific hardware in order to do this. And this allows us to have this debugging capability where you say when this variable changes, I don't care where, it, where the corresponding code is, I want my program to break. I found many bugs with this way. And I think this is a big improvement compared to what was the case years ago. On the other hand, Sometimes people are becoming lazy because you have all these possibilities. People are concentrating less on writing programs correct or identifying bugs on a paper or on a listing. They, they want to use interactive tools in order to find the bug. I think, think this is fine because we have these tools, we have these capabilities, so why not use them? So in general, we're getting better because the tools are more powerful and that might come at the expense of people working with tools rather than, let's say, look out of the window and think a lot. Mm -hmm. But that isn't terrible because the tools are so strong that it's worth it to make the developers a bit lazy. That's, that's more or less a summary, right? Exactly. And through that, we're building much bigger systems. So yes, maybe we're getting lazy and identifying errors in 10 lines of code because we can fire a debugger and find it for us. But we are not building systems with 10 lines of code, but 10 million lines of code. And you're saying part of the responsibility for being able to build bigger systems is because we're so much better at debugging and, and without that back-in-time debugging or these database breakpoints, we wouldn't have been able maybe to build such great systems, such big systems. With all the tools that we have, all the, oh, let, me take, let me do that again. The tools that we have, I wouldn't isolate back-in-time debugging because it's something that's currently evolving. It's not something that's universally used. Allow us to create much more complex systems. Yeah, in general, not just debugging tools, but all sorts of tools, of course. Mm -hmm. Let's stay on the topic of tools a little bit. You also mentioned this earlier in your interview, and I want to get back to this now. You said Git or version control systems are also very important tools of debugging. I don't immediately see how these things relate to each other. So could you elaborate on what does a version control system have to do with debugging? Absolutely. I would think that about a fifth to a fourth of the problems I'm uh, investigating and fixing, I'm using a version control system in order to help me debug the problem. How do I do that? First of all, I run git blame in order to see who changed a line that I think is a bit iffy. So maybe that line was changed 10 years ago or last week. The th two things are very different. It was changed 10 years ago. Probably the problem is not in that line. If it was changed last week, maybe a fellow developer introduced, or maybe even I introduced a fault in that uh, line. Another way that a version control system can help you is if you have an older version of the system that works and a newer that doesn't work, you can identify which change brought that problem. There's even a specific git command, git bisect, that allows you to find exactly which version introduced the problem. There may be 100 versions between the version that worked and the version where the problem was identified. Git bisect will cut that number to 50, then to 25, then to 12, and so on, until it identifies exactly the version where the problem manifests itself. I think this is extremely useful because you have narrowed down maybe 
2,000 lines of changes into 15 lines that were changed between the two versions that brought on the problem to you. These seem amazing tools indeed to use compare, uh, in collaboration with debugging tools. Do you think this is common practice? Do many people in, in practice use Git for debugging? I've seen it happening. I think experienced developers certainly do it, but these are things that we must uh, become aware of and learn. That's why I wrote the book. For a number of years, I was writing small notes for every debugging practice method tool that I used, and I tried to systematize them so that people become aware of them and use them, because I don't think that this knowledge gained through decades of experience is uh, accessible to all. No, I definitely agree. I don't think my first intuition would be to use a version control system. I'm still very much in this mode of the debugger. So I, I really learned a lot from your book. You also mentioned earlier in the show, but also in the book, that monitoring can be an important tool for debugging. Can you elaborate on that too? What do we have here? Nowadays, we have very complex systems, not a monolithic system, but something that depends, that runs on multiple CPUs, computers, even data centers across the world. So when a problem happens, you need to find out when it happened, why it happened, was what was going on at that time. For that, you need to have good monitoring. So find out which processes respond, how long they take to respond, when they stopped responding, what they were doing at that time. So being able to see the status of your processes and log all the actions that happen will help you identify the problem. So nowadays we're done. Debugging is not only uh, the task of finding a problem in a specific line of code, but identifying a failing process or a process that's responding slowly or a process that sometimes fails. These are different skills and different uh, ne require different strategies than identifying specific lines of code. So if I understand you correctly, a monitoring system can tell you, hey, this service is very slow or there might be an issue there, which I understand as support for being aware that there is a bug. But how does the monitoring system help you to fix a bug? You said earlier that modern systems, and I agree with that, are composed of many processes. So the bug may be completely unrelated to the problem that you see in the process being monitored. Some user somewhere sees a wrong number in a web page. But many levels beneath, you might see that the process is taking a lot of time to respond or is not responding at all. So if you have a complex system, being able to monitor and see what each process is doing and how it is behaving will allow you to isolate a complex bug that manifests itself in a very different uh, part of uh, your organization. Yeah, so it's again more about gaining a deep understanding of the separate elements of your system and how they work together. And monitoring is a tool that can help you understand how everything in the system is working together. Exactly. Often in modern systems, you see one web page and beneath it, hundreds of microservices have uh, executed in order to produce that page. If you see a problem in that page without knowing how all those things worked together, it's very difficult to isolate it and fix it. Yeah, so... so I think I can summarize that as that monitoring is also a tool for comprehension of the running system, not necessarily code comprehension in terms of reading a bunch of lines of code, but more getting an understanding of how everything is going. Exactly. Nowadays, we don't debug isolated systems. Often we, uh, de we debug complex systems of systems. And for that, we need to have an understanding of how all parts work together. Very clear. I want to talk a little bit about this new motto in software developing, ma mainly in Silicon Valley, where some companies say it's very important to just move fast and break things and we'll deal with the consequences later. How does that relate to debugging? Is this maybe, maybe also a, a response to the fact that debuggers are so good and we're able to find bugs very quickly through monitoring and through version control systems that... Are, are we less worried about bugs? And is this why something like move fast and break things can really gain traction? There are many reasons for moving fast and uh, breaking things, but the ability to efficiently debug what you have broken is uh, one, ex one reason why this can work. So if a failure is expensive in terms of the consequences and uh, how you can deal with it and how you can debug it, then of course you cannot move fast and break things and gain the efficiency that this might give you. 
If you can quickly isolate the problem, then move fast and break things is helpful. So let me give you a concrete example. Think of a, a system where you need to do some refactoring and you're not exactly sure what effect this will have. After the refactoring, you can try to compile it and maybe the compiler will give you errors in lines that don't match what is expected. So that's one failure that allows you to quickly identify what other things you needed to fix. You then run the system and the system fails on some assertions or crashes and gives you specific lines that crashed. Again, you can quickly, if you have the appropriate instrumentation and tools, you can quickly go to those lines and fix them. If you have good test coverage, this will identify most lines that were affected and this makes it easy for you to experiment and move fast because you know that you can quickly then fix and identify and fix the problems that have been introduced. Yeah, so it's partly due to debugging because, or maybe mainly due to monitoring because you can find issues and quickly address them. And also one thing you mentioned, of course, is that failure shouldn't be too expensive. It's probably not a good strategy to apply move fast and break things if you're building a spaceship or something, because if you made a time, it will be too expensive. Exactly. There are cases where this applies and cases where this shouldn't apply. And I want to talk about risk a little bit more. We talked about that in the beginning of the show as well. And you said, well, to lower the risk of debugging operations, testing is a really good strategy. So I want to talk about this intersection between debugging and testing. Firstly, there is this concept of testable code. If code is very modular, then it's easy to test. Is there a similar concept that you can say, well, this code is very debuggable? Is that a thing or is testable code also always debuggable code and the other way around? Right. So testable code is also debuggable code, but there are additional things we can do in order to make code easy to debug. Let me give you two examples. One is uh, when a function returns a specific value through a return statement, then it's difficult to see what the function has uh, returned, especially if that's directly used by another function that has called it. So by assigning that value to a variable and then returning the value of that variable, this makes it easier to understand what the function has returned. Otherwise, you might resort to low-level techniques such as looking at the values of the register where the value has returned its value. Another example is complex statements that are composite and have many different conditions, Boolean ands and ors and so on. Again, this is difficult to see which one of them has a specific value and why a complex Boolean expression results in an if statement being taken or not. If this is broken down to smaller expressions that you can step through and look with your debugger, this makes your life easier. So there are some differences, you say, between testable code and debuggable code because... If I may summarize your answer, the both examples you gave, I think, have to do with breaking the code up in small steps. Don't nest a lot of operations. Don't make very complex Boolean operations, but split it into smaller steps so it's easier to see where the issue occurs. That might be the, the general strategy you're describing here, right? Yes, you need to be able to identify both the flow in the code and also the values in the code. And if we are testing, so suppose everyone takes your advice, they go debugging, but first they add some tests. What type of tests are we talking about? Do you mean unit tests? Do you mean integration tests? What type of tests support debugging in general? It depends on the problem and the fault that you're trying to address. So if it's a complex uh, failure, then you might need an integration test in order to see it, but once you have narrowed down to a specific method, then a unit test might be able to identify it and show, demonstrate that you have corrected it. So it, it very much depends on the situation is what you're saying. Exactly, yes. Then let's talk about test code. I have often, maybe I'm the only one, but I have often encountered a situation where I was debugging for a very, very long time and I couldn't fix the bug. And it turned out there was a bug in my test code. How do we deal with that? How do we debug test code? Is debugging test code different from debugging regular code? Do the same strategies apply or are there different strategies? It's the same as debugging regular code with the advantage that you narrow down very much 
what you're trying to fix because you have an intimate coupling between the code that you check and the testing code. So I think in most cases it's quite easy to debug test code or the code that is being tested. In my experience, I'm always very thankful when I write unit tests that a specific problem was identified by the unit test and I didn't have to wait to see it in production through some obscure example. So, so in a sense, you're saying test, debugging test code might be easier because you've already narrowed down the place of the bug so it's easier to debug because the scope already is pretty small. Yes, and uh, we're always lucky when uh, we identify problems at this level of scope. It's much better to find the problem when testing rather than when a customer responds with an obscure failure case. Before we close the show, I want to talk about one specific issue in debugging that that happens when we program in one programming language, but we debug in another programming language. Nowadays, there are many programming languages that compile to JavaScript, for example, TypeScript. So you program TypeScript, but often the debugger runs on the JavaScript level. So you have these two levels, you're programming and debugging on two different levels, so to speak. Do you have any advice for that specific situation? Yes, the advice here is to become intimately familiar with the the target language. It's typically not very difficult and it's a very valuable skill. uh, We often have systems that compile from one language to another. Sometimes it takes time for debuggers to to get uh, to support the higher level language. And until that time happens, we need to become familiar with the lower level language where the program is developed, is compiled into. And uh, this doesn't only happen with uh, JavaScript, as you gave as an example. A very common case is when we are dealing with the mach- assembly machine language of where the code is debugged. This is a very valuable skill. Uh, assembly code is not something obscure and magical. It takes a li- little bit of reading and practice in order to understand it. And being able to single step through the compiled code is very valuable, a very valuable skill and sometimes something very useful. You see a statement, you execute it, and you don't understand why it works in a specific way. You switch to an assembly language view or to JavaScript, as you mentioned, and you see that has compiled to something that you weren't expecting it to compile into. You Maybe you've forgotten a semicolon or uh, misplaced a bracket and the precedence is uh, wrong, or it has happened to me at least twice in my life. There was a compiler bug that generated wrong code. So being able to see the lower level code not being afraid to do that is a very valuable skill. So until debuggers are good enough to completely operate at a higher level, at, at the TypeScript level, for example, we cannot get rid of the lower level language, the target language, because in some cases you would still need to be able to debug at the lower level, right? Exactly. For difficult problems uh, and experts people who debug code, they will need to do it, at the very least for the people who write the compilers from the higher level language to the lower level one. Now, that's that's maybe a bit sad because maybe some people want to rather program and debug at a higher level, but it makes total sense that un- until they're perfect, we really also need to understand the target level. As a professional, it makes you more valuable and you want to be in that place. True. Is there anything you want to add to the show? Anything we didn't cover about debugging that you feel very passionate about? The issue of tools, we talked about automation. What I think is very important is to get yourself uh, the knowledge and the skills in order to automate things with specific tools. Uh, One category could be a scripting language, so being proficient in, say, Python in order to automate how you deal with data, how you process long log files. It can be one way to deal with that. Another would be to use Unix tools on the command line so in order to to grab quickly through a source code base to identify where a specific division is taking place so that you can fix it uh, is a very valuable skill. Any other skills that you think or tools that you think are really valuable for debugging or maybe even in general? Yes, thank you for asking that. Tracing tools. So there is a category of tools such as S-Trace that allow you to see how your process is interacting with the operating system. 
if you sent me on a desert island and allowed me to take only one tool with me, I would take S-Trace rather than, say, a debugger. Because whatever happens in an application, it's usually through interactions with the operating system. By monitoring these interactions, see what files it opens, what it reads from a file, what it writes, what data it sends to other processes, what memory it allocates, you can get a very good picture of how the process is operating. So if you are not using S-Trace, D-Trace, System Tap, and so on, get to know these tools and apply them to problems that you may have. Okay, what, one final question uh, to close off the show. Y- your book has, has a lot of tips and tools and strategies, but maybe you can share your favorite one. If, if we just get one strategy from the entire book, what is your absolute favorite? Use your software's debugging facilities. So complex systems have built-in debugging facilities. This could be logging, this could be operating on the the foreground rather than as a daemon. This uh, could be giving you access to internal state. This often allows you to understand problems better, especially in complex systems. If you are dealing with systems of millions of lines of code, a debugger often doesn't cut it. That's why the systems have their own debugging facilities. And by using them, you can become a better debugger. So so the important summary there maybe is the tools you work with, you have to deeply understand them and have to know the capabilities of the tools you work with to use them in the most powerful way. The systems that you are debugging, yes. The the systems that you're debugging, yeah. Not even necessarily programming tools, but maybe the operating system or the processor that you work on or the database that you work with, stuff like that, right? Exactly. You mentioned the database. All databases have the ability to log the SQL statements they are executing and to explain to you how they process a specific query, what indexes they are using, and so on. So debugging a performance problem without using these facilities is like trying to walk in the dark, in a dark maze. That That's really good advice. Of course, we already mentioned the book. We'll put a link to the book in the show notes. But are there any other places, Diomedes, where people can follow you or read about the work that you do? I tweet through Cool SWNG, Cool Software Engineering, Cool Swank. I also have a blog where people can, uh, where I occasionally blog about problems I find and solutions I like. And I have a GitHub uh, account where I put this, uh, I put this code I develop. That's the Spinellis on GitHub. Okay, we'll make sure that all of those are added to the show notes so people can easily find you and read about all the exciting things you're working on. Thanks a lot for being on the show today. Thank you very much, William, for having me. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.